Hello, I'm Lou Bloomfield and this is How Things Work. Today's topic, ramps. Ramps are among the simplest of machines and they allow us to do things we otherwise couldn't do, such as lift heavy objects upward. Now, this wagon isn't very heavy and I can lift it straight up, but if it weighed a thousand pounds, I would much rather pull it up a ramp than lift it up a ladder. So why does that work? Why does a ramp make, make everything easier? And what is it making it easier to do? As we'll see, it makes it easier for us to invest a physical quantity into the wagon, in this case, uh, more gradually. And that physical quantity we're investing in the, in the wagon is energy. Well, before going on to all that energy and whatnot, let's start not with a ramp, but with a horizontal surface, like a sidewalk. So I'll, I'll reduce the ramp to just a sidewalk. And in this case, the wagon just can just sit there doing nothing, and it's an object at rest, remaining at rest. It's obeying Newton's first law of motion, which, which indicates that the net force on it is zero. Uh, you, you can't be motionless and stay that way unless you're experiencing no net force and you're not accelerating. So the wagon is experiencing zero net force. And yet we know it has a weight. The earth is still here. It's near the surface of the earth. It's being pulled downward. So it has a weight and yet it's not falling. It's not accelerating downward like a falling object. So something must be canceling out that downward weight. The something is the sidewalk, which is exerting an upward force on the, we on the wagon, specifically on its wheels. But, but the issue is it's an upward force on the wagon one that exactly cancels the wagon's weight. Well, first off, what kind of force is that that the sidewalk is exerting? And my name for that force is a support force. Support forces arise when two surfaces try to occupy the same space at the same time. They can't do that. They push apart and they'll push apart however hard it takes up to limits where things begin to break however hard it takes to prevent the two objects from occupying the same space at the same time. In this case, the sidewalk and the wheels are fighting each other, trying not to be in the same spot at the same time. Well, these support forces are exerted by any surface that encounters any other surface that they touch, they exert support forces. And those support forces are, are exerted exactly perpendicular to the surfaces at right angles in every way, also known as normal to surfaces. And so to give you an idea, what, what, what's a normal to a surface? That, that being a mathematical concept. This surface is horizontal. A normal direction, mathematically, is totally perpendicular to that surface. So it's at right angles in all directions, perfectly at right angles, perpendicular, orthogonals, all the same words, different words for the same concept. This is the direction of the sidewalk's normal force, or support force, I call it, on the wagon. The, actually, I should say, there are three different names for the same force. Support force, normal force, and contact force. They're all just different words, same idea. So, the sidewalk is exerting support force on the wagon straight up. Well, that's, that's lucky because the wagon's weight is straight down. And so the normal force that the wagon, so the support force that the wagon exerts, the sidewalk exerts on the wagon, is straight up, perfectly cancels the straight down weight of the wagon. Okay, if the, if the support force from the sidewalk were at some other cockeyed angle, they couldn't cancel. And that will start to appear when we tilt the sidewalk into a ramp. For now, they do cancel perfectly. So far, so good, but that, 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 uh, begs the question, so why does the sidewalk support force exactly cancel the wagon's weight? Why doesn't the sidewalk push a little harder or a little less hard? Who told it to push up or just the right amount? It's actually the result of a negotiation. When you first put the wagon on the sidewalk, the force that the sidewalk exerts on the wagon doesn't have to perfectly balance the, the wagon's weight. It can be a little too little or a little too, too strong. It's, uh, it, can, it can be un, un, imperfect. 
And what happens then is the wagon will begin to go into or out of the surface. The surface is a little springy. In fact, there is no such thing as a perfectly rigid surface. It doesn't exist in nature. Everything dents a little bit, or, or at least bends a little bit. And what's happening as I put the wagon onto the sidewalk is they're, they're pushing in and out and in and out and negotiating, trying to figure out just how hard, the, the surface is trying to figure out just how hard to push on the wagon to perfectly support it, basically to keep it from going into the surface or leaving the surface. If, to just consider, it, suppose the wagon is not being pushed up hard enough. The sidewalk hasn't decided to push hard enough. And that comes with the bending of the sidewalk. If, as the sidewalk bends, it pushes harder on the wagon. So when you first bring the wagon over and just barely touch the sidewalk, the sidewalk is not very deeply dented, barely at all, and it does not push hard on the wagon. It under supports the wagon. So the wagon now has a net force downward and it accelerates downward and it begins to move faster and faster downward and it begins to dent the surface more. So if the wagon is under supported because it's not denting the surface enough to summon enough support, the wagon begins to work to develop downward motion and dent the surface more. So not surprisingly, the force upward on, this, on the wagon increases. So if, it's, if, if the wagon's under supported, wait. The wagon's gonna get a stronger and stronger upward support force as it descends into the sidewalk. Suppose on the other hand, that the wagon is denting the sidewalk too deeply for some reason. In that case, the sidewalk is pushing up on it extra hard and over supporting it. In that case, the net force on the wagon is upward and the wagon is, wagon's motion is gonna to begin to develop in the upward direction. It will come out of the sidewalk to some extent. So if the wagon's denting too deeply, just wait a minute. The, the, the interaction between the wagon and the sidewalk will get the wagon to rise and dent the sidewalk less. So the long and short of it is, when you land that wagon on the sidewalk, there's a negotiation and a bouncing up and down that occurs until everything settles just right where the wagon is perfectly supported. Not too much, not too little. And that support comes from the sidewalk, which is dented just the right amount to summon perfect support for the wagon. At the same time this is happening, the, the, the sidewalk is supporting, learning and you know, developing the upward force to support the wagon. The wagon is pushing down on the sidewalk. Uh, if the sidewalk, if, if the wagon were sitting not on the sidewalk, but on your foot, you know the wagon would push down. And if it were a very heavy wagon, this would be unpleasant. So the upward support force that occurs on the wheels is accompanied by downward, a downward support force that the wheels exert on the sidewalk. One force and another force in response, action and reaction. This is what's known as Newton's third law, or it's, it's the introduction to Newton's third law, which observes that, for, that if, if one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object pushes back on the first object equally hard in the opposite direction. And that's always true, which is a remarkable thing. It means that when the sidewalk is pushing upward on the wagon, just hard enough to support the wagon's weight. The wagon is pushing downward equally hard on the sidewalk. In fact, because the support force of the sidewalk on the wagon is equal to the wagon's weight, but in the upward direction, the wagon's force on the sidewalk is equal to the wagon's weight. Uh, those, the two forces that are, that, are, that, are, that are a pair, that are a Newton's third law pair, are the force of the sidewalk on the wagon and the force of the wagon on the sidewalk. That's a pair. The weight of the wagon is a third, third thing, but it's the, the sidewalk is, is, because it is doing its best to exactly cancel the wagon's weight, the wagon is, has to push down on the sidewalk with a force equal to the wagon's weight. It's a, it's a logical sequence. It's not, a, it's not uh, a, a direct thing. The objects, the wagon's weight itself doesn't push on the, on the sidewalk. It's the wagon's support force that pushes on itself. All right, I'll set that one aside. You can read about that one in the text for more of, of, of whose forces are whose. 
but I will make a generalization that is that, that forces always come in pairs. Newton's third law pairs. If I push on you, you have to push back on me equally hard in the opposite direction. It doesn't matter whether you're asleep or, or whether you're moving or anything. You can even be accelerating. Who cares? If I push on you, you push back on me equally hard. Every time. End of story. So, the sidewalk has to, when the sidewalk pushes up on the wagon, the wagon has to push back on the sidewalk. Interestingly enough, the earth pulls downward on the wagon with a force we call the wagon's weight. There has to be a second force because it's, there's, every force is accompanied by a second force. What's the second force? The wagon's gravity pulls upward on the earth equally hard in the opposite direction. So the earth is pulling downward on this wagon with a force equal to the wagon's weight. And the wagon is pulling up on the earth with a force equal to the wagon's weight, but upward. So there are four, there are four forces in this, in this story. Two of them are occurring by, as support forces here at the bottom of the wheels and the top of the sidewalk. And two of them are occurring by gravity. The earth's force, gravitational force on the wagon, the wagon's gravitational force on the earth. All right. So we've got the wagon sitting still on the sidewalk. Everything's nice and simple. Now we're going to lift the wagon. Before I lift the wagon up the ramp, let's look at what happens when you lift the wagon straight up. When you do this, you put, you, to do this, and actually to do it at constant velocity, I, to get started I have to push extra hard on the wagon to, to, to accelerate it upward. But once I've done that, now I can lift it at constant velocity, and the upward force I'm exerting on the wagon, I'm going to run out of space, so I'm going to stop. So while it's rising, imagine that, while it's rising at constant velocity, straight upward, I'm playing the former role of the sidewalk. I am supporting the wagon's weight so it doesn't fall, so the net force on it is zero, and so it can coast. So you know how hard I'm, I was pushing on the wagon. I was exerting an upward force on the wagon equal in amount to the wagon's weight, but upward. And as I was doing that, the wagon was moving upward. So I was doing two things that are, are interesting. I, I was pushing the wagon in the upward direction, and the wagon was moving upward. I was doing what is known as work on the wagon, physics work. And physics work is the transfer of an important physical quantity known as energy. I was transferring energy from me to the wagon. Now, energy is an important physical quantity essentially for one and only one reason. It is a conserved physical quantity, meaning there is a certain amount of it in an in a, uh, isolated environment, no more, no less, and you can't create it or, or destroy it. You can only move it around between objects or change its form. So, if the two isolated object, the, the isolated system is me and the wagon. That's all there is in the universe. Everything else, you know, ignore it. Okay, the, we need Earth's gravity for this to be interesting, but okay, I'm, we're not going to, to exchange energy outside of the two of us. When I lift this wagon upward, which I will claim, which I'm claiming now actually, is involves me giving energy to the wagon. The wagon's energy increases and my energy decreases. Okay, so to start filling in some of the details here, energy, uh, a little more about, about it. It is a conserved quantity, that is you can't create it or destroy it, you can only move it around. This wagon cannot uh, increase its store of energy without receiving it from somebody else, like me. Uh, I can't give it energy without consuming some of my own, losing some of my own. So it's, it's interesting, it moves around. And, and my analogy uh, to, to, to moving energy around is, is moving money around. If, if you don't, if you don't uh, break the law, money is, is a conserved quantity. You give it to someone, your money supply goes down, their money supply increases, and assuming that they don't burn it, and assuming you don't print more, which you know, both of which are kind of not, uh, not typically uh, something you want to do, it's conserved. You know, it moves from one person to the other and so on. So, conserved quantity, energy. Uh, energy incidentally has no direction to it. It is what is known as a scalar physical quantity. It has only an amount. Uh, the units we'll see are, are what are known as joules, which is a short, and joules spell J-O-U-L-E after a physicist, not like uh, what you go when you, when you go shopping for diamonds. 
So, energy. I'm going to put energy into the wagon. The, the method, the mechanical means for transferring energy from one object to another is work. Physics work. And physics work uh, requires a very simple procedure. You do work on something when you exert a force on it and when it moves a distance in the direction of that force. So, I am, in lifting it, I am doing work on the wagon. How so? I am pushing upward on it. How do you know that? Well, if I stop, of course it falls. So, I obviously was pushing upward on it to, uh, to cancel gravity so that it could be net force zero to coast. So, I'm pushing it upward and it is, it has to move in the direction of my force, namely upward. So, right now I am not doing work on it. I am pushing on it, but it's not moving. No work. But once I get it moving, then I'm pushing it upward and it's moving upward, then I'm doing work on it. So, this is work on it. This is no work on it because it's not moving. And if I move, if I push on it upward and it moves downward, opposite my, 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 the force I'm exerting, then I do a negative amount of work on it or negative work. So, this puts positive work, puts energy in that transfers it from me to the wagon. Negative work takes energy back out of the wagon and returns it to me. Uh, instantly, where does it go in me? I turn it into thermal energy, which is a disordered, fragmented energy that rattles around in me and is measurable by way of temperature. Uh, I don't do anything useful for it. Uh, when I lift it, I'm taking useful energy out of myself and putting it into the wagon. Where did the useful energy in me come from? For my breakfast, okay? Calories. Calories are actually a measure of energy. So, I, I'm using up my store of, of food energy, putting it as, uh, into the wagon, and then I'm taking the energy back out of the wagon and putting it back into me as thermal energy. So, uh, a few more observations about energy, and, or about work. If you push upward on something and yet it moves at right angles to your push, you do no work. So, I'll give you an example of that. Let me start over here and let me get, get moving. So, once I'm moving it, now the wagon's moving at constant velocity in principle. I'm pushing it straight up to support its weight and yet it's moving to the right horizontally. That's my force and the, the, the direction of motion are at right angles. I do no work. So, anytime I push upward and it moves upward, to the extent that it moves upward, I'm doing work. The horizontal part of its movement doesn't count because the force is upward. You can't do work with a, with a vertical force. You can't do work when things move horizontally. So, only the vertical rise matters. So, this is work in. This is the same amount of work in. And, and when I lower it, I take the energy back out. All right. When the energy goes into the wagon, what form is it in? You, you can see me transferring and I've already told you about that, that energy can take the form of, of, of food energy in me. Well, food energy is associated with, with chemicals and, and so it's, it's, it's a stored energy uh, in me associated with chemicals. Stored energies are known as potential energies and they are energies, potential energies are all energy stored in the forces between or within things. In the case of my food energy, the, I, I'm, that is chemical potential energy. That's energy stored in the forces between atoms and molecules all associated with chemicals. When I put the energy into the wagon, it goes out of my, my store of chemical potential energy and goes into another form of potential energy which we can call gravitational potential energy. Energy stored in the gravitational forces between things. And in effect, I'm stretching sort of the gravitational connection between the wagon and the earth as I lift the wagon. So, down here, the wagon has relatively little gravitational potential energy. As I lift it upward, imagine I'm stretching some sort of rubber band and I'm putting energy into the wagon's attraction to the earth. I've invested gravitational potential energy into the wagon. And when I lower the wagon, the gravitational potential energy is coming out of it and going into me and becoming thermal energy, which we'll talk about more in the future. So, at this point, I've talked about two kinds of, of potential energies. Chemical potential energy in me by way of food and, and actually the air is involved, the oxygen of course, 
in the areas involved in that potential energy. And the second type of energy I talked about was, was uh, gravitational potential energy, the energy in the forces of gravity and stored in those. Uh, I should point out a third type of energy, which is the energy associated with a moving object. Moving objects carry energy in their motion, and that energy is called kinetic energy. And so if I get this guy going, actually, to get, to get the little, little wagon going, I have to do work on it. It's an object at rest, staying at rest. In order for it to get, to get moving, I have to push it, say, to your right, and it has to move a distance in the direction to the right. So I did work on it in the act of, of getting that wagon moving. I pushed it. It moved a distance in the direction I push. I transferred energy to it. The energy went in not to gravitational. It's not going higher. It's going faster. So I was putting gra uh, I was giving it kinetic energy. So there are three three forms of energy. There are, there are a number of other ones, but those that's a good start here. So this is a story of ramps. Where are the ramps? Well, right now. We can invest gravitational potential energy into the wagon by going straight up. We just lift the wagon up, up a ladder, and it turns out the energy that we put in depends only on how far we lift it upward, because the force needed to lift it is an upward push. Horizontal stuff just will get it moving left and right and will temporarily put in some kinetic energy, but eventually it's going to be motionless again. It will take the kinetic energy back out. The horizontal motion just didn't make any difference. All that matters is how far we lifted the thing. So the, the investment of gravitational potential energy uh, ultimately in the end, at the end of the day involves raising the height of the, of the in this case, a wagon, and the, you, you need to know how far you lifted it and how much it weighed. Because if you, if you support its weight perfectly and let it coast upward, uh, steadily, you exert an upward force on it that is as strong as its weight, and it moved upward the distance you lifted it. So, the work you did is its weight times how hard you lift, how high you lifted it. That's all that matters. All the horizontal stuff irrelevant. Well, you can do that with this little wagon because it doesn't weigh very much. But if you fill it full of people, now I could fill it. I could put a lead brick in. It. Imagine there's a lead brick in it. Now, ugh, I don't want to do that anymore. So how are we going to get it up to, say, about you know, this height without lifting it straight up? Go on a ramp. If we go on a ramp and we put the wagon on the ramp, first thing to observe is it can't just sit there motionless. If you release it, that is, if, I, if, I, if I'm not involved in this, it's not going to just sit there. It experiences some sort of downhill force, net force, because it accelerates downhill. Where does that come from? Where does that downhill force, what I call a ramp force, come from? Well, it comes from the imperfect cancellation between the same two forces we have been looking at earlier. The wagon's weight, which is straight down, and the support force of the now ramped sidewalk. Remember, the, the support force that a surface exerts is at right angles to the surface. And since the surface isn't horizontal anymore, the, the support force is not horizontally either, not vertical. It's up at an angle. So the two forces on the wagon when my hands are not here are the weight straight down and the support force up at an angle. They don't cancel anymore. They leave something left over. No matter, the negotiation still occurs to make sure that the wagon doesn't go into the, too deep into the side, well, into the ramp, or too far out. The negotiation still occurs. But when the negotiation has done its best, the, the support force on the wagon and the wagon's weight don't cancel anymore. They leave, when you add them together, as you, as you have to do to obtain the net force on the wagon, they leave a residual. And that residual net force is downhill perfectly. And it's a geometry problem that gives you that downhill direction. And it, it, the strength of that force depends on the steepness of the ramp. If the ramp is fully vertical, like this, it's still in frame, good, then, then the cancellation is, is horrible. In fact, it's no cancellation at all. The support force is a horizontal force. The weight of the wagon is vertical. They can't cancel at all. The wagon experiences the full weight, the full, uh, its full weight, and it falls at the, at the full acceleration of gravity. On the, at the other extreme, if the ramp 
is not tilted at all, then the cancellation becomes perfect. So the support force is now straight up vertical and the weight is straight down vertical. They cancel perfectly and the wagon is happy uh, at rest. So in, going, in tipping the ramp from horizontal to vertical, the downhill ramp force goes from zero to the full weight of the wagon and everything in between. So if we go to a, a you know, partial you know, tilt like this, the downhill ramp force in this wagon is always oh, probably about uh, 10 or 15 percent of the wagon's weight. It's a gentle downhill force and that's why it causes a gentle acceleration of the wagon when I release it. You know, it doesn't, it's not like this, that full, that full acceleration due to gravity. It's like a, a tenth or an eighth or a, of, the, of the acceleration due to gravity. Well, I can, if I start pulling uphill, I can cancel away the, the ramp force as well. So I'm adding a third force to the story, my hand. Uh, these are support forces here too. And I'm pulling it uphill just hard enough to cancel the ramp force. And at this point now, the wagon is inertial and it can be at rest as a result. Or if it, if it had been moving before the story started, like, don't watch yet, let me get it moving. Okay, now it's moving. I'm still just perfectly supporting it. I'm pulling up just as hard as the ramp force is pulling down, but it's coasting upward as a result. Net force zero. So, so you can coast uphill if, you get, if, if, if it's already moving. You can coast downhill if it's already moving and you can just be motionless. So in pulling up on the, on the wagon with a force that, that cancels the ramp force, I allow the wagon to coast up, down, or sit still on, the, on the, uh, the ramp. Well, since the ramp force in this case is only maybe 10% of the weight of the wagon, my uphill force is only about 10% of the weight of the wagon. I can handle that. Even if that wagon weighs 1,000 pounds, I only have to pull up with a hundred pounds of force on this wagon handle to keep the wagon inertial. So if I pull a little extra hard uphill, I can get the wagon started and then I, it coasts up. I still have to pull and it still has to move, but uh, it's a gentler process. You can pull a very heavy object in the absence of friction, which is why I got wheels. That's a story for another day. You can pull a very heavy object up a ramp. Uh, you just have to approximately cancel the ramp force. If you pull a little harder than the ramp force, you get it to accelerate uphill and, and, and that's good for getting started. If you pull a little more gently than the ramp force, it accelerates downhill, which is good for stopping. And, and in between, you, you pull exactly as hard as the ramp force and you can keep it coasting up the ramp. So, at this point, it's clear you can pull very heavy objects up ramps or push them up ramps, assuming no friction. And wow, that's great. The ramp helps you lift the heavy object. It's obviously getting higher and higher as I'm going up the ramp. But there's no free lunch here. You, know, you don't get something for nothing. If you pull something up the ramp, which is, which is done with a gentle force, much gentler than the weight of the, of the object, you're increasing its gravitational potential energy. Of course, you're lifting it. But in order to do, to, to invest the same amount of gravitational potential energy you would invest by going straight up a ladder, uh, a short distance, you have to go up the ramp a long distance. So ramps have a trade-off. You pull more gently. The forces you exert on the wagon to, 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 to raise, its, raise its height, its altitude, the forces are smaller. But the distances traveled are greater. And that's all about work. In lifting the wagon straight up to a certain height, let's go for this height. I'm gonna go up a little, a little lift. I'm exerting a large force on the wagon. It's full weight upward. And it's moving a short distance. So the ladder approach, big force, little distance. The ramp approach to, to lift the wagon the same amount is a gentle force, but a long distance. The product of those two, force times distance, uh, traveled in the direction of that force, that's the work I do. So here I'm doing the work of lifting the wagon straight up with a big force, little distance. Here I'm doing the, the, the work of lifting the wagon up with a little force, 
for a long distance. And the product of the two, in this case, little force times big distance, imagine multiplying those two together, is the same value as this, big force, little distance. Same work involved in lifting the wagon up. And that's as it, as it must be. Energy is a conserved quantity. If the wagon is here, remember, hor the horizontal position of the wagon makes no difference on its gravitational potential energy. Whether it's here or here, pff, not important, because there, there's no gravitational force in that direction. So if you're, you see the wagon here, and now we, we cut the video. You know, don't look, don't look. You look back, and there the wagon's up here. All you know is that I added energy to it. You assume that I'm the only, the only, the only actor in this story, right? So, so uh, I must have put the energy in. But did I go straight up with a big force, little distance? Or did I go along the ramp with a little force for a big distance? You can't tell. And it doesn't matter. The energy investment was the same. So all you, you know, it, 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 it simply doesn't matter what path I take in, in taking the wagon from here to here. I put the same energy in, whether I went straight up the, up the ladder, whether I went up the ramp, whether, in fact, whether I took the wagon and I, and I, and I went home and I came back and it was, you know, it was at this height by the time I returned. It, it's irrelevant. All that matters is the, is the increase in the wagon's gravitational potential energy was a certain amount. I had to have transferred that amount of energy to the wagon somehow. Anyway, back, back then to ramps. What ramps do for us is they allow us to do the work that we have to do in order to lift something or break things apart with a wedge or you know, anything you do with ramps. It often involves doing work and adding energy to something. So the ramp allows us to do the work necessary to make something happen with a different relationship between force and distance. It'll, it'll, they allow us to use smaller forces and longer distances to do the same work that we would otherwise have to do with large forces and short distances. And that's the story of ramps.